Okay, let's get started. Um, today we are going to have two speakers, Ken Nakayama here and Lindsay Powell, who's hiding in the back right there. Um, and just to briefly introduce this topic, um, Ken is the, has for a couple decades run the Harvard Vision Lab, which is probably the preeminent place in the world uh, for the study of vision in humans, and they use mostly behavioral methods, and he'll talk about that today. Um, what, what he'll be focusing on today is not just the application of serious, hardcore psychophysical methods, which is a very venerable tradition, which you've probably heard a little bit about, um, but Ken has in, in recent years become interested in very high-level visual perception and particularly the perception of people and what they're doing and what they're thinking, this whole new domain of social perception. And, and I think of Ken as the person who more than anyone else has kind of identified this whole intellectual space of, uh, of social perception as an interesting one to study and one where you can apply some of the traditional methods of visual psychophysics to these very high-level problems. So he'll be talking about that today, and that'll be a real treat. And then we'll hear from Lindsay Powell, um, who got her PhD recently with Liz Spelke, working on uh, the perception of social um, phenomena, high-level social stuff, uh, like, for example, interactions between people and the nature of the relationships of people um, in infants. And so she'll tell us about uh, what's known about social perception in infants. And at one point, I was also going to lecture about um, functional MRI approaches to high-level social perception, but I gather there's enough already with the lectures. So I'm not doing that, but I'm happy to chat with any of you guys about that at lunch. So let's switch the earpiece over to Ken. <laughs> Nancy. Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, that is a reasonably accurate introduction in terms of what I'm going to talk about, but I'm probably not going to talk so much about the methods. I, I was told by Professor Pujo that you're heavy on all kinds of technical things, and so, but oh, uh, but I could. I mean, happy to talk to you. I'm going to be here all day. Uh, until quite late, so I'll be around if you see me lonely all by myself or something. Don't hesitate to come in or even up and talk to somebody else. So I really, uh, I, I like lecturing, but I value it more interacting with people and look like you're the kind of people I would like to interact with. So uh, I hope you will take that opportunity. Okay, now, oops, where's the thing? Oh, right there. Oh, over here. Oh, I can walk around. Oh, I thought I was. I thought I was tethered. Yeah, I think we should crank you up. Ken. Yeah. What? You're you're a little quiet. Oh, I can crank you up. Really? Okay. I cannot hear. You can't hear me? Okay. Oh. All right. I can hear myself. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay. So, as Nancy said, I'm. I've been in this business such a long time. Um, I was in grad school when you're. If you're or in college when your grandparents were in college, kind of thing. But somehow they can't, in, in America, they can't force people to retire. So I'm keep, I'm keep going. Anyway, you guys are, I take it, looking at your CVs, or not your CVs, but your pictures, where you're from, you're kind of, a, I call STEM people, science, technology, engineering, not everybody, I don't want to uh, label you, but so you've got, you're accomplished, you've got good training, or we're going to get good training in, in, in the real mathematical things. You'll have analytic tools, and, and I think that's really important. I'm not going to knock it, but I do think people can get away with not having that as well, as you may find out. Um, and I've had three PhDs in my lab. I mean, I'm a psychologist. I was a social psychologist when I was no, I, when I was an undergrad. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I was interested in history and philosophy, and I majored in psychology because it was easy, but, and social psychology was even easier. But, but then... Uh, I know in those days, when we went to, what did we do when we graduated? We didn't plan very much. It was, oh, shit, I got to go to graduate school or something or medical school. And then I said, social psychology is too flaky. I can't do that. So somehow I wangled myself into a graduate program in neuroscience. I didn't know anything about neuroscience. But so, so, that, so I'm, I have a kind of a neuroscience kind of prejudice. I, I don't do neuroscience, but I'm very interested. In, I don't think. I have a little prejudice that neuroscience is not going to explain much of behavior because I think we're still in the field. But at the same time, I'm very interested and I follow it. If you're doing that, it's great. And I've had three PhD postdocs who are physicists in my lab. And that's what's sort of crazy. And, I, and they, we didn't do any physics. I mean, we tried a little bit of it, but I always told them, you're going to have to do experimental psychology. Sorry, come to my lab, you've got to do that. And they did, mostly did pretty well. And, and I think that they had a certain kind of grit 
that other people didn't have, which I think is quite good. Um, but again, I think what's important, you're starting your careers. I, that, uh, you, you, you might want to hear some advice from people who will give you sort of you know, free advice, which you're free to not take. Um, basically, I think if you're really smart, that's important. It doesn't hurt. Uh, it helps, helps sometimes. Um, but you have to have something to be smart about. And so what I'm trying to do is to expand your horizons a little bit because I think I kind of had an interesting conversation. I was on a plane to Britain and this Christian fundamentalist was talking my ear off. But then somehow he switched to business. And um, he, he failed in business several times and he, he made his fortune again. And he, after he stopped talking about Jesus, we talked about his business. And he had this little expression in me said, the money is in the buck, which, which means that you get money in these really horrible areas. And so what he did was he, re, he regenerated himself. He, he was trading the Norway, he's an Irish guy, Baltic or something like that. He, he realized that, pow, you know, the stuff at, at uh, Trader, not Trader Joe's, Home Depot, those, when you have a forklift, you put all that stuff on the fork, they can move it around the left wood. He said, that's gold. And so he, he made his fortune sort of recycling that. He, it's a, millionaire again, preaching Jesus and stuff like that. So that's what I'm telling you to do. In other words, there's certain areas that have not been really mined, and maybe social psychology has already done, I don't know, but there's plenty of things to study in, in, in science, and I, I'm just trying to expand, just give you a taste of some things. Uh, it may be obsolete, but uh, we'll, we'll try here. Um, and so I'm, my talk is to be a little bit more exploratory. I, I think it's very important to take a Define problem and really work it out, but at the same time, I think we need to expand the horizons of science as well. No, it just didn't work here. In advance. Oh, there we go. Okay, so when I started um, st the study of vision way back when, that was the visual area. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was before a lot of the uh, work that uh, Kaz and Allman did. And, and so my, my PhD dissertation was recording actually from the RET and visual cortex and cats. And I need, need not go into it, but it's very low level. And then all of a sudden, I, I think I was asleep a little bit, but something happened um, along the way. And uh, just after 1970, all of a sudden the visual system got to be huge. It just got to be much larger. And uh, this is really a big surprise for me. Like there were, I, I remember I read a paper or 10 or 12 visual areas incredible. And then you saw the, probably you've seen these pictures here. This is this is old. It's not even new. And so we've got all these different pictures of expanded visual systems. We've got a dorsal and a ventral and it's kinda of like Russia expanded I mean, it was around Moscow and then so it went all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So it didn't go all the way. I mean we, you know it's, we, we, there's still other parts of the brain. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so and then there's the the dorsal and ventral system, we know about that. And this is really nice. And most of you have heard of David Marr and David Marr said Vision is determining what is where by looking. It's a really a, a seminal sort of set of ideas, and his, his work is, is very important. But I'd like to just sort of go beyond that. And okay, here's some more, some more versions of the visual system, how big it is. Basically, you can see this is the monkey brain, and half of the brain, essentially, is vision, which I thought was pretty neat being in vision. Not, not <laughs> bad. So I call it the enormity of vision, just huge. And just think about it. I mean, here's vision over there on the left, and here's everything else. I mean, amazing. I mean, just so it may be more than just what is where. That's the point here. We we need to we need to come up with. We got to fill this thing with more stuff here. It's it's not just object recognition things like. There's got to be there's got to be more that this is doing. So basically, we have to sort of think about that, and we we have to have vision is more than determine what is where we're looking. That's the that's that's what I would argue. And I think the spirit of this conference and this whole initiative is certainly uh, on, 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 uh, it's the same. So some of the things the vision's for, and I think it's not been studied that much, but anytime you do anything, you're doing, I mean, there's all kinds of memorized actions that are not visual, but just think of all the things you do in life. A lot of it is visually controlled. So when you have your whole, your whole motor system has a visual coupling, I don't think it's fully appreciated. I think people study motor system, they study visual system, but they don't study both. And I think you really can't understand action unless you do that. Then there's something really important. I think, I mean, most of you know about the wonderful work done in hippocampus and things like that. I mean, most animals are in, a, in an environment and just they just 
they go wandering off and they come back and they don't get lost. I mean, the way we do. And they have primitive systems in the brain, probably really ancient, conserved, that have to do with navigation getting around. I think this is going to be, and, and many people think the whole memory system is based on this process of hippocampal medial temporal lobe system, is based on the primitive system, just knowing where you are and getting, getting around. And then the thing we're going to talk about today, and this is uh, Nancy Kanwisher's uh, charge, in a sense, in this whole initiative, is social perception of behavior. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But I do think that these other things, if you want to go poaching into other areas, fair game. I, I still feel that these are things that are extremely important, and uh, you don't need to go to social perception. Um, so I don't know if you've, people have talked about these different characteristics, probably, anyway. But they, they're, they're different kinds of things that might go into social intelligence and things like that. And so the way this, the, the CBMM thing is organized at the research level, and we're part of this, is to sort of think of all these different things like development, intelligence, circus, intelligence, integration, and sort of that sort of, that doesn't mean this is the most, social intelligence is the most important thing, but social intelligence is based on these things. That's sort of the idea. So that, that's one perspective. Oops, what did I do here? So, so um, and of course, there's, it could go both ways. Sometimes it's not just a one-way thing. And, but I'd just like to point out a really interesting essay by Nick Humphrey. If you read my essay, um, I, I really basically just sort of made a sort of commentary on his essay, really. And, and it's in, in, the, in the thing I recommend it. It comes from a monkey neurophysiologist who wrote a, uh, I was just happening in, in, I was stuck in the University of Tokyo library once, and I didn't have anything to do, and I just picked up a book called Machiavellian Intelligence, and I found this chapter by Nick Humphrey, and I just sat there and stopped reading it. And basically, Nick Humphrey is saying something quite different. First of all, he's really down on social psychologists. He said, Experimental psychology could have tended to regard social psychology as a poor country cousin of their subject. And, and so, but in a sense, he, he, he says something else, like he wants to turn psychology upside down. He basically says, wait a second, even though these people are not great, social psychology is very important. And in a sense, he's basically making the argument, and he's overstating it perhaps, but just most of human intelligence really derives from social intelligence. And, and he, he makes the argument, and if you look at my chapter, you can find the reference, and you can write to me, and I'll send you the essay, which is really a brilliant essay. My estimation. And, so, and I read this thing over tw 25 years ago, and it's sort of just catching up with me now. So one of the things he mentioned was that if you look at the size of the neocortex in the brain and relative to the average social group, the, the, the brain size and the size of the social group sort of track. Just think of it. Just think about social groups and things like that. I mean, object recognition. You recognize the object, done. Okay. You don't need to keep saying, this is a cop. This is a cop. In the social interaction, it's just totally, everything's happening all the time. I mean, there's still information coming in. Let's say there's two people there who you're not so sure of, and you're, you're a primate or something like that. They're talking too much together. Maybe they want to overthrow me. In other words, the, more, the, the, the larger the groups, the number of interactions possible is just, it multiplies incredibly. In other words, there's 10 people. There's all kinds of possible coalitions can be forming, people making eye contact with each other, uh, you know, making eyes at each other, as they say, or you know, dis or dismissing the other person, which is very important. I mean, you're so, most animals are social. Your social world is, in many ways, much more important than your physical world. Because if you isolate from your social world, you're done for. So basically, the kind of intelligence you need to deal with all these n by n whatever polynomial exponential whatever it is, it's just tons of interactions that are possible. So you need something up there to be able to handle it. That's that's his argument. So basically, here's his quote: the intellectual faculties of primates have evolved as an adaptation of the complexity of social life. For better or worse, styles of thinking which are primarily suited to social problem solve color the brain behavior of man and other pyramids, even towards the inanimate world. Maybe mathematics, who knows? I mean, the kinds of things that you think are the, really the core of what your discipline is, maybe that evolved in a sense because we have to do all these other kinds of processes. We don't know. That's an interesting thought. So basically the idea is that possibly social intelligence, it could be almost primary rather than just derivative. So I just want to talk about a couple themes in social, social world. 
And one of them is I, a couple of concepts. I think this meta concept of Dennett. Daniel Dennett, you ever heard of this guy? He's a philosopher who's I really feel is, I'm not sure he's well regarded in philosophy, but I just really think he's really an amazing psychologist. I mean, he just talks. But I think the things he says, he doesn't, you know, I don't think he's done an experiment in his life. But I think he's, he's really got interesting things to say. And I'm, I'll just talk about the intentional stance. What is the intentional stance? So it's basically recognizing acting on the beliefs and desires of others. So I'm sure that's kind of obvious. But let me just sort of break it down. So then it has three levels for predicting behavior. Physical stance, design stance, and intentional stance. Physical stance, you guys have studied this most of your life. Physics, gravity. You, you can predict something's going to happen because you understand gravity. You throw something up in the air, it comes down because you understand gravity. Um, same with water. You, you know that all kinds of properties of water, if, you, if it gets really cold and you've got your, your uh, bottle of water in your car, your glass bottle of water, you know it's going to fracture because it's going to, it's going to freeze and it's going to break the glass. So understanding of physics, in a sense, maybe it's not the kind of physics you know, you've taken graduate school or something like that, but it's basically intuitive physics. You know these things. It's, it's physics. Then there's something called the design stance. This is, you understand things because the way they're designed. You've got a coffee maker. It doesn't matter if it's an Italian coffee maker or it's, it's, it's a stove top thing that put espresso on it. You heat it up and the thing sh- that stuff goes up through there or it's a percolator and stuff goes down or all different kinds. You know it's a coffee maker, and you can predict what it, it can do, in a sense. It, that doesn't, the physical qualities are secondary to its design, its purpose. Think of the vehicles. If you see a vehicle, you know it goes somewhere. If somebody is jumping into a vehicle, running there, you know he's going to go somewhere. You don't, you don't predict it from its physics. You predict it from the fact that it's a vehicle as a purpose. Same with biology, but we'll, uh, we can capture that later. But then there's another level. <laughs> This intentional sense, and this is where Dennett was so brilliant, and I think maybe psychologists have said this before, but he just, he just laid this out in relation to other forms of understanding, and basically prediction. I mean, if you want to predict something, I mean, you can't predict many things, but you know darn well that, you know, somebody's going to show up at eight o'clock, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning because they're the teacher and they're teaching a class. They know, you know that person isn't a goof off, they're responsible, they come, and you know what they, what they value. They, and all different kinds of things. You can predict so many things your friends and associates do because you know what they want, you know what they value, you know what their beliefs are. If the person doesn't know something, then they're not going to do something because that's a lack of knowledge. So there's so many things about people that you can predict it's not physical and it's not design. It's really having an understanding of what their beliefs and desires and knowledge is. So, so, oops, I keep doing this here. That's the intentional stance. We'll come back to this. There's these several themes in social in the social world as well, and it's, these are obvious. And they they, they kept, people keep writing papers on it, but I see, but and they keep coming back. One is you know in the. This is in the biological world, in the physical world, all around us, we have hierarchy. And some people get lots of stuff, and some people don't. Some people get a lot of sex, some status, food. And this is really the same in the animal kingdom. And you've heard of the pecking order and the chicken farm and stuff like that. And that, it holds well. I mean, we all have tendencies for democracy and things like that. But one of the fundamental aspects of human life and animate life is there tends to be hierarchy. I mean, it's not universal, but it's, it's a tendency. And there's, and there's, so there's competition. There's other thing I call, I call pro-sociality, in the sense that people, and I think people are not recognizing it over the last number of many decades that I've been in psychology and neuroscience. I think this is something new, actually. People didn't realize that there is a sort of almost inherent pro-sociality. People want to be nice to other people, to be agreeable, help each other out, things like that. Felix Varnigan in my department shows that kids, very, very young kids, even if if it, I forgot how old they are, but they just it's surprising if somebody seems to be in distress. He's worked on interesting experiments that kids even want to sort of help out. And why would that be? Well, this is where the study of 
evolutionary psychology comes in, in the sense that we have, in many ways, many kinds of animals are social, but there's something I call private property or territory, in the sense that one group of animals, let's say chimpanzees here, has a certain group, and then you have another group over there. Well, these groups are perpetually in competition as groups. So if you have competition within the group, and it gets to be, as uh, what is it, Hobbes, nasty, brutish, and short, that really is not going to help you deal with the other group. So you have to have some degree of affiliation and help, helpfulness within the group. So I think these are two very important themes in we deal in the social realm, from the, which are, I would call them near universal. In other words, the, the, the sense of hierarchy or status seeking in a sense, and, but, the, but there's another thing, pro-sociality, heroism, and people will go out and do all kinds of things just for the group. So what I would call, when we're thinking about the intentional stance, we're now talking about a non-reductionistic approach. It's not physical anymore. We're talking about beliefs and desires. And I'm, I'm going to say this non-reductionistic approach is gaining some legitimacy. You may not find it's legitimate, but I'm saying it does. And maybe you think about 10 years ago, you'll think, hey, maybe that's true. So I'm just putting that out. So, so how do we study this? We, we have this broad framework. How do we study? So I'm not going to tell you how to study it, but I'm just going to give you a few little pointers in this direction, how we might go about it. And one of the ways I think we should go about it, if what I'm saying is correct, we need to see it in the broad biological perspective. In other words, all the things that I've said here about human interactions, to some extent, in a much more reduced and less complex form, are probably related in many animals. And so how do we proceed? This is a, one of my favorite quotes of a physicist, uh, in any field, find the strangest thing and then explore it. And um, I've always felt that's a cool thing to do, and I, I don't discourage you from doing that. And I think it's much more interesting than conventional hypothesis testing type of research. I'm, I'm one of these mavericks who never has any hypotheses, usually. Or, or if they are, they're very vague and wrong. So, so, so um, uh, most of everything I've gone into has been, I've always gone into fields I have no understanding of it at all. It just seems, it just seems I, I don't know what to do. So I, I sort of, uh, one of my uh, idols is a guy named Bailu Yu, as he called it, paratroopers. So just, just dive into something. So, but I would say in the social realm, maybe one thing to do is identify some core things, common things, and, and, and explore them. Something that's maybe obvious that hasn't been explored. So that's, another, that's another way of the money is in the muck. Maybe there's stuff just under your nose. That's just a possibility. So again, we talked about human social behavior and of these things. And, but I just want to mention a, a number of things here which are um, things that we all know about. You know, I, I list down there, carrying teasy, laughter, revenge, warfare, it's all of us. Okay? All things that we do and uh, with some degree of style or uh, viciousness or uh, you know, humanness. So, um, so and I, and I make, I'm making the argument that we share this with animals. And so what I'm going to do now, and this is not empirical research in the traditional sense, I'm just going to show you some videos. Because if we do share this I can convince you that we share this with animals. We have an incredible treasure trove from biology. We, if we have a lot of complex social interactions, and they are shared by animals, and then we, we realize that not only are they shared by animals, but the brain structures and the whole process that we do, because we do this quite naturally, it, there's a sort of continuity here. And we, we can exploit that or under, help, help us understand understand it. So, okay. So, now I'm going to show you uh, a, a, a couple um, film clips here, which I think uh, characterize the... Uh, let's see if I know how to do this. Okay. Okay. So, and I'm hoping to get a little discussion here. So I'm going to show a number of film clips here, and I just want to, and I have my own interpretations of them, but I'd like to get yours in a sense. What, what, and this is quite a long one, and many of you have seen this one before. You might have seen it many times, but I don't care because I've seen it many times. It's still 
it's still fun to watch. So you'll just have to bear with me. If you really can't stand it, it's okay. So this one, how many people have seen the Battle of Poop? Okay, not that many. Okay, great. That's good. So this is, um, oh, wait, i got to get make it bigger. This is Cougar National Park in South Africa. It's an amateur video, just by chance. It's kind of like, okay, this is like a meteor strike. It's watching a meteor strike the Earth. You don't see it there.
So when I was a graduate student, I took the course, I was going to answer you, my, um, a guy, Ted Bullock, who I think was one of the major figures in uh, systems neurophysiology, he was at UCLA, I was a grad student. I took a lab course and we, we dissected aplesia and all kinds of recordings from millipedes and things like that. But he said one thing to me, I was kind of interested, when he, wasn't, he, he was not a hypothesis testing guy, he said, when you make an observation, something strikes you, it's interesting, try to extract the meaning of it for yourself. What did you learn from that? I just want to let you ask you questions. This is this went viral, 75 million hits. I don't know. Did you learn something from this? Were you surprised? Why why do 75 million people watch this video? Just gore? What is it? The good guys win? What is it? I'm just curious. Uh, every different animal. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, every, every different animal has a particular thing that it's really good at, and they're all like basically the same amount. They're they're all at the same skill level, but all fighting with each other. Um, but and no one can really only you can only get a tiny bit of um, like. Uh, benefit over other, other okay, so that's a really interesting idea. I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the nature, it's, 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 it, there's nothing real, the, the, it, it, because of evolution and ecology, there's nothing really, really dominant. It's, it's always an equilibrium and, and competition. Interesting, interesting idea. And I assume what you're going for is that this, this was basically sort of like, like you know, epic drama in, in, in the sense of like, I don't know, like, like, like Nordic myths or something. something. <laughs> like you know, the, the, the there's some vulnerable like, buffalo or whatever that was, and, and getting attacked, and then um, then you know, trying to or its parents or whatever go away and come back with a giant army, and, and then there's like crocodiles for some reason. And, <laughs> but it, 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 it has a form of like a, a of a very classical kind of drama, I guess. I know, what I got out of it is that, you know, as a group, water buffalo can operate together towards a particular goal. They will communicate and then organize their actions such that they can achieve something that communicates between themselves. And I don't know, maybe, maybe I, I just have a really bad view of water buffalo because I think of cows, okay? <laughs> and these are, you know, they're ungulates and stuff like that. They're stupid. They produce milk. Okay? <laughs> That's their little things, you know, their little bins and stuff like that. That's all. I mean, that's what's going to go on here. So there's a, the, this whole, this is sort of the, the myth, you know, Joseph Campbell, the, 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 the archetype stories of life and stuff like that for him. But from a scientific point of view, I'm just trying to bring more stuff out here. We don't need to go on forever, but is, 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 what's the science here, if any? But I think back there, I think that's a very good point. Even in these stupid water buffalo, you're seeing some pretty complex social structures. You've got, it's not just herd mentality, uh, but rather some sort of empathy towards that's been brought down and desire to you know, not just run away then. 
defend uh, one of their own. And you'll see, and I'm an, I'm an animal video sort of junk and stuff like that. You see animals, that, I mean, animals that are constantly fighting with each other, all of a sudden, in these kinds of situations, demonstrating what I call heroism. Just, they would just go out. It, it, we'll talk about the meerkats. They, they, this is a rattlesnake there, and this, these kinds are battling each other, and then they're all battling a snake, and this one animal will go out and attack that snake all by himself. I mean, this is a very powerful... Uh, so these aren't experiments, but I think in some ways they are naturalistic. I mean, there's a whole field called ethology, which animals, you know, people get in their duck lines and look at things, but with YouTube videos now, I mean, you know, we, we're all sort of you know, ethologists now. Okay, so then one more thing here, just kind of just to cap this a little bit. Let's see if I can get, get this. Oh, okay. Oh, oops, sorry. Now I'm not very good at this. Who's going now? Oh, escape. Okay, there we go. Escape. Okay. 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 It's got an interesting one here. Here's an interesting video here. It's a short one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get this going? Like, am I off the screen? How do I get this thing going here? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that little circle. Oh, the circle? Yeah. Okay. Oh, i got to do this. So this one, I don't know, I called revenge, but what do you think, what, what, what was it? I mean, that, that, that was pretty shocking to me. I don't know, maybe you guys are much more familiar with animal behavior. Is, is revenge a reasonable word? They're often just very territorial, right? So just territory. You met a lower level explanation could do it. You don't need something like the concept of revenge. How, how do other people feel? Just deterrent don't mess with us in general, right? Okay, so that, this is the kind of issue we have to deal with. I mean, we do, do animals actually have, we have a human concept of revenge, but maybe that's really unnecessary. We don't know. Uh, score settling, or something like that. Is that something built into animal brains, or is it just something that we do? Maybe it's still part of the defense like the, the baby water buffalo wasn't dead yet, so they went back. They gathered some more defenses and then returned. I think this is a different. This is a totally different video, but I, I don't. Oh, really? I don't think it was the same people. This is just. I don't even. I don't even. Nancy knows her. 
significant other is involved in this kind of stuff, I would worry that some of this stuff is staged. I don't think that that last one could easily have been staged. Right. The previous one. I don't think. Right. Right. So we don't know. I mean, this is if you realize just like just like these bad experiments, there's you know misleading video. Okay. So. It's an application of cuts. Maybe what you can do is like cut in between these line cuts or in some grass someplace else. So, okay. We make good stories. So, but at the same time, it's worth thinking about. I mean, do we, are the human kind of concepts, should we do that? Or should we just say it's neuron 239, you know, synapsing on another network or something like that? How do, how do we go about talking about this? It's, that's a, we don't know. And, uh, that's for you guys to think about. Um, okay. any, any more thoughts here? I'm going to show two more concepts here. This is um, another thing here that I'm going to show here. We're fine, We're fine with time. Um, this is the, um, I apologies to Alan because he, I went to another meeting and all I did was dominate the meeting, showing these things. <laughs> You're showing the one with the monkeys. That's right. Well, that's uh, it's a great one. Okay. At least he thinks it's good. But what's interesting, they're not monkeys. See, that, that shows our the primatology. Uh, we call it the primatology awareness week. Because monkey, honey monkey, yeah, uh, here's. This could have been staged, but I don't think so. This is in Thailand. Gibbon.
So, um, what do we do? I mean, I'm going to have an answer here because John knows, he probably knows this thing, doesn't he? I don't know. But, but he will probably yeah. tell you this, is, this This looks kind of staged to me, but there's quite a bit of... Staged or not, I don't <laughs> think that can be staged fundamentally. So what do, what do you think? What, is, what, what, is it, what, what, what kinds of explanatory concepts do you want to bring to bear? Well, it's, what I like to is heavily uh, um, narrated by a person, right? So that no. it's sort of hard to say even if you saw it in a single frame without any narration, it would have the same or sound effects as that. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. That's why this went viral. But at the same time, um, to get some animal to do that, I mean, I'm marvel at just this has nothing to do with the social realm because I'm not, I'm not hanging around with these uh, gibbons. Just the visual motor coordination under extreme danger. I mean, you know, you guys played in the jungle gym or something like that, but this is, I mean, just recognizing what vine to grab that, I mean, with the possibility if you grab the wrong one, those guys are going to get you. I mean, it's a, a, a extreme skill. I mean, we go to the Olympics and watch all these people we watch uh, all kinds of gymnasts and stuff like that, but this is these guys don't take gymnastic classes or anything like that. They don't coaches and stuff, and it's pretty damn amazing just from the physical. But can we come up with some kind of sort of low-level explanation that would sort of wash away the social sort of uh, sort of the intentional stance here? What, what do you think? Well, I don't think you completely do that. If you view it through the lens of just territorialism, the given knows he's not going to be able to kill the computers, but he can make their life hard enough that they're going to leave. If we could just sit up on the tree and wait for them to go. <laughs> I mean, if. Yeah, but then there's I mean, still around the territory. But and if, I mean, if the marauders into your house come in there, you know, coming into your house, and you, you, you hide in the attic, and then they leave, right? You want to go down, they've got guns, you want to go down, you're. Oh, yeah. There's an asymmetry of force there. Yes, but it's also like saying the marauder is also taking up residence in your kitchen as well, essentially. Okay, so this, okay, this is, uh, this is okay. self determination, that we call it? I mean, this does not seem to sense that this is hard to escape, but that given is just having a bit of thought, you know? <laughs> I mean, there's no. There's no um, you know, he doesn't have to face it. And also, he just jumps on the ground. I mean, he's sitting there. I mean, if he stayed up there, but he just goes there and just watches, waits. I mean, I mean are these wild animals? I don't think, I don't know what they are. I don't think that's, and they may be in some kind of game park or something like that. But anyway, um, if you could train your game park animals to do this, you'd do pretty well. Right? I, don't want, I don't know if you want to do that in front of a big audience because it might slip up a little bit, right? So. <laughs> Okay, so one, I think one or two more of these, but, but um, so I'm sorry I'm not going to give you, I, I could give you lots of graphs and tables and things like that, but um, I hope this won't. Um, okay, so here we go. So, so I called that, the anthropomorphizing it, I called it, just for the simplest word, teasing. And is that a bad word? I mean, so that, that I, I sort of feel there's something, some, I mean, we know that humans tease all the time, and it's sometimes vicious, but sometimes just super fun when you're kids, your brothers and sisters, it's just, it's just part of your daily life. So is this something that animals do to each other? I don't know. I, I think, and, and what is it? What, what is it? So these are the kinds of things we don't know, but they're all around us all the time, and we haven't thought about it very much. But if it is phyletically old, it's something that, just don't know. And the, the, the teasing part, and I think this is the, ne the next thing I think I'm going to do, it's the only other one. And this is a guy, um, a guy named Jak Panskat. I don't know if some of you might know this guy here. I, I used to be on a study session with him. I'm doing up. And uh, I was very impressed with this guy. He was he was a rat guy. And he, he was very, uh, he, he said things very ahead of his time about about 35 years ago, dopamine, and social bonding, and stuff like that. Who is, who is this guy? Well, anyway, here he is. Um, and he's going to... Mr. 
Sorry, that's not good. Or maybe can it just for up? Maybe stop it. The audio is attached. Is this is there's another audio? Yeah, but I but I let me just stop it for a second. Uh, I've got my own speaker, but that should be okay. It just. Right there. Oh, but there's no. Right, right on the left here. Right there, make that go up. It's all the way to the. But there's a. Um, I can't hear. Is there? Where's our AV guy? Because there's a little knob. I got my own speakers here, but they couldn't be any better, could they? Might be. Is there an audio track? Uh, yeah, there's an audio track. Um, you know, another possibility is you could just undo this and hold your speaker in next year. Right? Just play it on your computer. Oh, oh, oh. oh right. That's good. Right. Yeah, that's it. Anyway. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Try
<laughs> so um, I, I, I'm sort of primed for this because I somehow I got uh, uh, some guy knew knew Ted Turner and he said I can go on Ted Turner's ranch. So we took this jeep into Ted Turner's ranch and we saw his house. And then there was this whole for the far as your eye could see, like big sky country, just incredible. It was at Montana. And then there's this, we came upon this huge herd of buffalo. And, and they were pretty scary. But then also we kept driving along, and there were, these, there were these little buffalo, and they were frolicking kind of like kittens. I mean, just like those bears. And so, I was, so anyway, that's, have you, have you all seen animals doing this? What's this all about? Any thoughts here? I think that play has have some like unconstrained learning benefit where you get to explore a wide range of stimuli or phenomena without like uh, I don't know just kind of exploration to a wide range of that's, that's the one very common explanation for play but what about the fun part I mean I think most of us as kids it was fun okay <laughs> Don't get around. What's it learning? It's fun. So what, what's fun about? Um, I'm thinking about maybe it kind of imply there's like common reward system in both like humans and animals, sort of like that. So you get like dopamine and then you, you get happier and then you learn more. And then, and then you're with other, you're kind of specifics. I think there's a kind of, I'm just guessing, there's a bonding in a sense, some kind of way of uh, I mean, we talked about the need for affiliation. Need to sort of, that could be possibly it. I mean, we just don't know. But I'm just, the broad outlines are we have, we have a super amount of competition with, within animals. But at the same time, there's a certain degree of sociality, which is very, very primal, it seems to me. I mean, I don't think people are studying, tick, I mean, there are people studying tickling, but the very neurophysiological point of view, they're tickling, and sometimes you tickle people, they're not ticklish, and things like that. But this is, this is so the teasing and the and the tickling. Maybe they're related. So, I mean, there's, there's a certain kind of connection here. Also, though, um, humans just I don't know what happens with the animals, but uh, humans are able to play alone. Right? Sorry, was that? Humans are able to play alone, like imagine things, and have this uh, piece of a box of imaginary truck. I don't know, but with animals, I don't know if they do it or not. So that's that's a different use of imagination. You still play, but for a different reason, right? There's, there's nothing social there. No, I think there's, there's many, many things that humans do that animals don't even come close to. I mean, there's so many things humans in solitary. There's things like people, babies, I'm not, maybe Lindsay can do it, but they get a bunch of different uh, size balls and I'll spontaneously arrange them in terms of, you know, sizes or just class of red ones and green ones. They'll just start doing that, putting red ones in this bucket and green ones, even without being told. I don't think anybody's shown animals to do this. I mean, this is something that humans do all kinds of very spontaneous things. Uh, I don't think there's one I would argue that the animals, you can't get an animal to play patty cake, but I just saw on the web two cats playing patty cake. I've seen this viral video. But anyway, I, I don't know. There's a lot, I don't know, but I think this is... But, but back to the playing yeah. alone, too. Um, <clears throat> it also seems that when kids are playing alone, there's still, I would bet a lot of it is pretending that there's people and sort of anthropomorphizing things and things like that. So we have more imaginative power to do it, and so animals just don't have that kind of power of imagination, things like that, to that could be it. So. Okay, so let's see. We're running out of time, which is okay. Can I just add something yeah. to brief, Ken? Sure. I think the idea that, that play is, is partly a social function is, feels very right, but I think there are other important functions of play, not just for, you know, wiring up your perceptual motor system by giving it lots of random experience, but I don't know if Laura Schultz talked about this in her lecture, but her research program is in large part showing that children's play is not random, but consists of a whole set of very particular ways in which kids test hypotheses about statistics and physics and how the world works. And she shows with elegant experiment after elegant experiment the ways in which uh, the interventions that kids perform on the world in play are really uh, ways of testing hypotheses about how the world works. So this is, there's so much here. Uh, we don't know. 
is it the social card? Is it the social bonding? Is it the, uh, he makes the claim that if you play, you know, you, 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 you're a better adult. It's just in a social way. What is it? The play, if the, 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 the leaders of England are trained in the playing fields of Eton or something like that. I mean, but, but this whole idea of sports and the whole process of cooperation and things like that. So, uh, speaking of cooperation, uh, war. Uh, I, I, a, a lot of evolutionary psychologists claim that this is universal. I mean, I'm not sure it is, but very common, stuff like that. So um, um, we need to go see pictures like this. But I just want to talk a little bit about these animals called meerkats. This is a uh, group of animals in the Kalahari Desert who are about, uh, you may not have a bit about them, they're about, they're about a foot tall. They, they, they're, not, they're not cats. They're, they're related uh, 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 cladistically to um, mongoose, I think, or something like that. Uh, and they can they can do things like kill. they what they do is they they live underground and they uh, at, they go to sleep at night and they come up and then they forage during the day. And what they do is they uh, catch many different kinds of prey, but they're kind of omnivorous. They do catch little animals like scorpions, and they somehow they're able to deal with scorpions. Scorpions are quite poisonous. These are quite small animals. They, just like a mongoose can sort of overcome a cobra, he's got, that, that's their sort of, their, their thing that they overcome is the, is the scorpions. And it is probably, I mean, I've looked around quite a bit, it's probably the most studied social animal in the world. And they're, they're in troops. They're, they're, their political organization is uh, sort of uh, related individuals, and there's an alpha female. And the female is extremely dominant, and that she, um, what she does is that she, um, uh, her, she has daughters, and if daughters have babies, she usually kills them. She makes the daughters take care of her babies. Uh, but every once in a while, if the daughter is very nice and does stuff and licks her so many times, then she can have her own daughters, stuff like that. And the way daughters get pregnant is because they go roaming around and some errant uh, cool dude just happens to be there and they mate and stuff like that. So this causes all kinds of problems. It's so interesting that you've watched you know, soap operas. This is a four-year soap opera in British BBC television. And I, I didn't watch all four years, but I did watch a couple. And it, I, it, did help, it did hold my interest. So this is just an interesting situation where uh, there's one group called the Whiskers, and group the Lat- I can't remember. There's, there's two groups. They're, they have different territories, and they, they have territories about a square kilometer. Just think of an, an animal this big, and going over a, kilo- a square kilometer. This is a huge amount of territory that's theirs in a sense. And and if there's any kind of infringement, I'm, I'm, I'm just reminded in a sense that one of the shocking things that Jane Goodall mentioned, she, she one of, every time she come up with a new pronouncement, she said, "Oh my God!" So she found that. Two um, uh, chimps were sort of on patrol around their territory, and they just spotted another chimp from another territory and just killed it. So we're talking about a very strong sense of enforcement of private property. And in this situation here, what's happening is that the um, uh, because you can't really patrol all your you have these little bur- not only have your main burrow, but you've got these burrows over all these satellites, like summer homes, or every call extra residence and stuff like that. So, so what happened? This other group started squatting in this extra residence. And so, this is the video here that I'll show you what 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 happened. Uh, let me see. What am I doing? Oh, that's the wrong one. Okay, here we go. Oh, I don't have that one. Okay, I'll have it here. I was trying to get a, I sort of, I don't know if you ever watched these samurai movies where you have these two armies and they have flags and stuff like that, and they're going in together. This isn't the best one of the meerkats, but you'll see their tails, which I consider to be their flags. So 
go through here. The tail's going to be up. Oh, sh I do want that. Well, I kind of lost it here. Let's, let's just hold on. I'll just have to let you get it from my videos here. I sort of now. I'm just not very good at this. You got to close that. Yeah, okay, we'll be okay. 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 So, up. That can be. Maybe we can talk about that later. I don't want to. Speak. Okay. So, I don't know how much more time here. So we got to go beyond this here, and um, I just talked a little bit about in the human realm here. And there's a work of one of my colleagues at uh, Harvard, who uh, sadly died of cancer. She was uh, kind of a pioneer in just doing, just making videos of humans, very short videos, and have people just judge them. It's quite well known now, uh, and it, we call it zero acquaintance types of, um, of judgments here. Um, she, she did kind of an interesting thing where she, uh, uh, most of you are in undergraduate environment, maybe most of your graduate students, you're a teaching fellow or something like that. And what she did was she just took teachers of teaching fellows and um, professors at Harvard. And then we have a thing at Harvard called the Q Guide, which you get ratings as to how good a professor you are. So what she did was she just took a 30 minute silent video or just had to come to mobile speech or something like that and got quite a bit of high correlation just by people just crowdsourcing just saying how good they thought that teacher was or something like that with just by you know just getting people's gesturing so that that was a, a kind of a form of communication that we're talking about that is not I mean a lot of social psychology in the past has been questionnaires and things like that but, but I think the important thing that her which she did and her always did but just look at normal human behavior and just see what kinds of information are available, and I think this is something that I'm quite interested in. Uh, and that one of her students did something on gaydar. I still, I still find this be unbelievable. Basically, she just showed still pictures. Uh, uh, but she went to gay and lesbian clubs and stuff like that, and she was still pushing massive, like 50 milliseconds, and people were better than chance and saying were gay or straight or not. I mean, it's, it's not the basis to action or something like that. Get telling her, don't, don't, don't say anything like that. Anyway, uh, you can tell whether people are. This is the kind of stuff that Nancy wants to do a little bit of, to set up these situations and, and, and to try to get uh, good judgments of what people are doing and possibly look at brain mechanisms here. So, uh, one of the things she did really quite nice um, was, uh, and it's quite a lot of practical applications, uh, not just theoretical, is. She was able to uh, predict by just videos of doctors talking to the patients which doctors would get sued because you have to have outcome measures. And it was kind of doctors that seemed really confident. confident. This is the ones that got sued sometimes. So remember that when you go to med. So, and, and, and so the, the ones that weren't, the friendly ones weren't sued. So, you know, these are things that, and maybe they resonate with what we think, stuff like that, but these are things that people really to talk about. So I'm just going to finish up with a few more minutes, um, just talk about something totally different, and these are studies that are well studied, and I'm just going to mention them because these are not published studies, but they represent collaboration. I just done these in my student labs, and, and, and I just want to show you how, how uh, robust certain kinds of uh, judgments are in social perception. Uh, basically, look at a face, and you have other people look at the face, and you have, and you rate them, or you, and basically the judgments are incredibly consistent. I'm not saying accurate. We don't know what the word accurate means. Uh, av and, and one of the things that is defines it, and you know about this, is the average face. And then there's a mask and tampon issue here. So I'll just go through some of them. Here's, here's, I took a bunch of faces. Uh, these are people, uh, just, these are Harvard undergraduates, mostly. And uh, you can see that uh, the top pair are single faces. 
and the second or single faces. The bottom pair we've done is we've morphed two faces together. They look pretty good. And I've, I've blurred all the faces a little bit because when you morph faces together, they get a little bit blurred. So just to make sure it's not just blur, you just can morph. And then you can, you can naturally morph more faces together. There's, there's a uh, four faces morphed together, and there's all eight. So uh, maybe you won't admit it, but um, the ones that are more morphed are more attractive. Most, most. What's interesting is if you can get attractive ratings of every face, so what I'll do is I can show you a bunch of faces you know, and then get the mean attractiveness rating for list face number six, face number seven. Then I can look at any one of you as an individual and say, how did you rate those faces? Uh, what, what, in other words, if you see a face and the, the, uh, the, the, the group said that was a seven and, and you said it was a seven, you get a good uh, correlate. So, oh, well, first of all, we want to show that uh, uh, we don't need to talk about this too much. So, basically, these are the correlations with the group. They're quite surprisingly high. In the sense, and these are, in other words, these are the correlation coefficients. This person has a correlation of 0.9 with respect to the group. This is an incredible conformity to the group. I, I, I just find this quite surprising. Uh, here's some person who has unusual dates, people. But, and this is a college population, so they much, maybe they're much more conform and things like that. But I just found this pretty astounding. The degree, uh, this was a card sorting. I, could just, I just went to the dining hall and I just had people sort 15 faces. I, I'm just stunned by the degree of um, the kind of data that you can get just from a very simple, seeming innocuous experiment. Um, so this is the range of correlations in the sense that people, their, coral, their individual correlation with the group. And that, that we, uh, one of my uh, postdoctoral students did something sort of slightly weird. He, he took friend, he had pairs of people who knew each other and had some friendship to each other. And he found that those people's coral judgments of other faces were somehow more correlated than perfect strangers. And he also did this with, I think it did monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And there was no, there, it was a completely shared environment issue here. That, so that would sort of, so here's a kind of a situation. This sort of shows the uh, uh, increase in attractiveness with, with the number of faces that are morphed. And uh, I, don't, I don't go more detail. I think that's enough. And this is uh, just the final thing about Gender, and this is quite interesting. There's another thing that is related. But let's say we have a bunch of faces, and just say how masculine or how feminine are these faces, and then with a separate group of people, you don't even have to use the same people, just say you know which face is attractive. Each, each one of these dots is a face, and these are the judgments of faces. Let's look at the, the black dots there. In other words, if a face is judged feminine. It's attracting if it's this way up here. If it's judged not feminine, it's here. So, in terms of beauty, we've got something very strong in terms of the gender axis. Males, quite mysterious here. What's male attractiveness? So, Alex Todorov thinks he has the answer, but at least it's not masculinity. And this has been repeated many, many times. And I just want to just talk one more thing I think I've got here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, one of my uh, students here, I think Nancy was on his committee. His committee Richard Russell, was it his committee? You did that closed act thing in the first I think okay. So Richard Russell found that if he just took photographs of male and female faces, that the contrast between the mouth and the eyes in female faces just naturally occurring, no makeup, was higher than the contrast in male faces. It's just a fact. I mean, it wasn't it was super easy to do. He just took pictures of people and just measured the uh, luminance values in terms of digitized the photos and got the, got the values. And so then what he did, and I'll make a long story short, he morphed male and female faces here was sort of androgynous. And all he did was to accentuate the contrast of these features here. Most of you will see that. The accentuated contrast looks female, decentuated contrast looks male. So here, and then of course, you all know, I'll have to tell you, that this is really the basis 
largely likely the basis of a lot of cosmetics, since a lot of cosmetics emphasize darkness of female eyes and, and lips. And uh, he he didn't even have to go hunting for this. Uh, Chanel came to him. He's, he's, he's a, he's a grad from Chanel. So uh, I'll, I'll just end there and maybe give you some time for some questions. Thanks very much. Again, I'm hanging around here, so try me. Any questions or break up? I don't know. Here, Paul. <laughs> well, maybe it'd be useful to say a little bit about, you know, what can we do to study this area? What are the some What are some of the, is you know, methods, empirical avenues we can use to to study this space? This, this huge space here. Uh, well, there's many. I, I could talk about methods. I don't know if people would accept, but there's some really interesting methods uh, with respect to faces and to bodily motions. Most of you are aware of the Johansson figures or people walking along. Uh, one of my colleagues, his name is Nico Troy in Canada, is a PCA of all, all walking, and he's found basically not surprising that the, the first two four year coefficients in the walking the pendulum motions and so on. First harmonic and second harmonic. There's a lot of second harmonic. There's, there's things like up and down. Every time you walk, you go up and go down. You step, it's like that. And, and you just, you can just, there's 225 coefficients for Nancy's walking and my walking. And it turns out, as you many of you know, that if you just have a dot display with the certain joints here, you can say, hey, yeah, that's Nancy Cambridge. That's the way she walks. Maybe she doesn't have that distinctive walk. Many people you know, do have a distinctive walk. And what you can do. In that kind of situation, you've got 225 coefficients, uh, which are basic X, Y, Z for each one of the elbow, for the wrist, and things like that. Then what you can do is you can take another person who's somebody else, and you can morph between. Them. You can just make a continuous. Thing. So you can measure people's ability to discriminate person A from person B. You can do this with faces as well. That's a common thing in the world. Of, I'm not just talking about stimulus manipulation. I'm not talking about but stimulus manipulation. My field of psychophysics is quite important that you have some kind of continuous uh, measure. It's not, oh, I think we can, become, we can fetishize that too much, but in the world of face recognition, there's, it, we understand faces to the extent that we can, uh, do a, we can do a PCA of faces in a more sophisticated way. Is a, a, there's many different ways to do it. We can talk about that later. We essentially, you can have every possible face that look very natural. I was using this all the time. You can have a natural face and you can just dial in your face. And you can make, and you, there's a, we, you can think of a face space as an n-dimensional space with sort of the average face in the middle. And you can go anywhere you want to and dial it around. You can, there's many different, a, a cool technique, uh, most of you know about color adaptation. If I give you a, a, a green patch here and stare at it for a while, all of a sudden when it goes off, you'll see red. Well, you can do the same thing with a, particular face and face face, you can show that face for a while and show it and then turn it off and then you show the neutral face and you'll be able to, you'll see the anti-face, the face that's not that face. And, or you can look, you can show the anti-face to Nancy and then, uh, and, and then what will happen is your perception of it and the neutral face will look more like Nancy or will be more heightened or things like that. So there's ways of study, may not, this is not to say that face is the only thing to study. I think this is, Probably, in some sense, overstudy a pretty crowded area, but a lot of people have worked in the area and have gotten, there's, there's lots of um, interesting sort of commercial applications and things like that. So it, it's, I mean, I just went to a conference just on faces in, 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 in England. So it, it, that's an area. Um, I think some of the more naturalistic stimuli are, are going to be the really challenging one. Just, cause I think faces are fine, but I think just, just everyday social interaction. This is something I'd love to be able to explore. Can we come up with some elemental social interaction that maybe fit into these categories of affiliative and dominance and things like that? We know that dominance is something uh, very easy to read in a face. Uh, Sky Todorov did it. A lot of it has to do with just the play with your chin, stuff like that. It's a lot of very strangeness. So these things are uh, up for grabs. There, there are ways of studying in a very qualitative way, very quantitative way. But th that's just most of the stimulus. You have to ask some really research questions. Well, maybe, Nancy, you have some 
you'll tell me what we should do. 